Welcome to another episode of the Alpha Mind Podcast, where we have amazing conversations with outstanding people from the world of trading and investing. Our guests include traders, analysts, trading and investing psychologists and coaches, writers, and an array of experts on all things trading. What we really want to get to on this podcast is clear answers to the question, what leads to great trading performance? Over the past couple of years, we have chatted with numerous guests about the things they have learnt on their own personal journeys through the markets. In this podcast, myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, ask the questions, have the conversations, and go to places so that you can learn from others and challenge yourself to improve and get better. The ability to cope with setbacks, deal with adversity, and have the grit to battle through the difficult times is the very bedrock which training success is built upon. Today, we are delighted to have not one, but two of the world's leading experts on these themes on the podcast. Dr. Doug Mackerman, a distinguished professor of European history and global affairs at the University of Wisconsin, has studied the history of burnout and is passionate about regeneration and escalation of talent. Dr. Paul Stoltz is considered the world's leading authority on the integration and application of grit and resilience. He is author of five international best-selling books on the subjects, was voted by HR Magazine as one of the top 10 most influential global thinkers, and by Executive Excellence as one of the 100 most influential thinkers of our time. He has given a wonderful TED Talk on adversity and has also been a regular guest on the Opera Winfrey Show talking about these themes. Here are a couple of excerpts from this podcast. The most afraid of is failure. And being afraid of that is everything. It limits your openness to decision making. It makes you less agile. It takes away the nimble creativity that a child can have and turns instead into this rigorous thing where do you trust your gut that says this is a really bad deal, but I'm going to go for it anyway? Do you trust your gut? They will suck the marrow out of your bones. They don't, they don't care about your vitality and, and well-being. They don't care about you flourishing. They just want you to endure and deliver the numbers and get them to their next equity event and move on. What we need to do is equip all of us with the tools they need to open up that inheritance and put that baby to use. Because once they do, everything from how they trade to how they come home at the end of the day to how they vacation with their families, to how they love everything will be better. We are sure you will get a lot out of this podcast. And if you do enjoy it, as a reminder, we would be delighted if you could rate our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or whichever service you use to listen to the Alpha Mind podcast. And even better, if you could leave a friendly review. Before we hear from our guest, we would like to mention that a big part of what we do is about arming people to be at their very best. And a big part of being at your very best is having the best tools, the best training and the best education possible. That is why we partner with the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, as our sponsorship partner. If you are serious about becoming a serious trader, then learning technical analysis properly should be something you should consider. This is why we highly recommend looking into the STA Technical Analysis Home Study Course, which is an online version of the course which supports their diploma program that is delivered at the world-renowned London School of Economics. Alpha Mind podcast listeners can get a discount to this course by visiting our Alpha Mind blog page, that's alphamindblog.blogspot.com, or just Google Alpha Mind blog and go to the page link STA Home Study Course. Now on with this week's podcast. We're delighted to have Dr. Doug Mackerman. I'll do this in alphabetical order. Dr. Doug Mackerman and Dr. Paul Stoltz with us. This is going to be full of energy. It's going to cover stuff that perhaps we've touched upon on the Alpha Mind podcast historically. But this gives us an opportunity to get sort of professorial in terms of what's going on, what we can do to, to kind of take off, lift off, flourish in this getting rid of COVID type of world and trying to get back to normality. Um, and perhaps the starting point is perhaps, Doug, if you could just give give some background and tell us a bit about you, Doug, and perhaps as Doug finishes, Paul, you can just crank into, into yourself. Anyway, welcome guys to the show. Thanks so much, uh, both Mark, Steve, hosts here uh, for having having me here and, and for my partner in crime, Dr. Paul Stoltz. So 
I'll try and be brief because his story is going to be more interesting, I suspect. But my background has been really in academic work on issues around exhaustion that high net worth individuals, really successful people have endured in the modern era. My first book coming out of graduate school at UC Berkeley was called Leisure Settings. And it was this deep dive look at what was happening to powerfully successful young men who were reaching the end of their rope, literally in some cases, through a set of like overwork practices that no one was finding sustainable. So I dove into this work in French, British, German, and Austrian history about the 1870s, 80s, and 90s as a whole new diagnosis around male anxiety and male stress and overwork is actually born whole cloth. So that's kind of been my background, looking first at what are these diagnoses of like male overwork and exhaustion that have happened historically, and then B, what are the kinds of regenerative strategies and tactics that have been used by super successful people, not just men, but a lot of male interest has been like the center of my research over the larger sweep of time from spa culture and going to watering places in the 19th century through beach vacations. The constant in all the work I've done, friends, has been the role of medicine and of kind of a super ego element stepping up to high net worth, highly successful people saying, if you continue down this road, you will absolutely collapse. You will have nothing left. You will lose the capacity to be creative in your problem solving. And finally, you'll lose the capacity to actually go out and make money. So that's my kind of intellectual background, friends, if you will. I've been a university professor and distinguished professor most recently at a couple of institutions in the USA. I've got my PhD in cultural studies. And my passion now is a new project I'm working on with Dr. Paul Stoltz called Sabbatigo, that really is a regenerative journey for top talent leaders globally to pull them out of the environments they're living and working and getting crushed in and move them to a new headspace and a new physical space so they can regenerate and call back on their powers of resilience and grit, Paul's words, and return to their most creative capacity to succeed to lead with cleverness and cross silo thinking and to get past the exhaustion that we know is crushing people today in even worse ways than we see when we look at the research I did on the 1860s to the First World War era. So I hope that's uh, not too much of a preamble, uh, friends, but that's, that's me in a nutshell. I've been a professor for years and I love this work and I love trying to help people come back into contact with their passion, their creativity, and ultimately, of course, their balance. Thanks, Doug, for that great introduction. Now, Paul, over to you. Well, so like, so, you know, one of the things I try to equip people to do is be weird in a good way. And Doug, I got to tell you, man, you are super weird in a super good way. Because <laughs> there's, like, there's like, nobody has your combo, you know, and the thing you've made your life mission right now is just more necessary than we ever imagined, right? I mean, you know, my life's work started 40 years ago, believe it or not. I, I got in the grill of my academic advisor at the time. He was this ex-Special Forces guy teaching this leadership class, you know, and I think I had way too much to, and I kind of leaned into this guy and I go, how do we know who wins? He goes, what do you mean? And what? And I said, you know, anything, business, sports, school, life, whatever. And he goes, say that a different way, you know? And I said, okay, who fails and who prevails? And so he literally pokes me in the chest and he goes, okay, punk, that's going to be your first research project. Go find out. So I went to that place. What's it called? Begins with an L. Oh yeah. Library. I had not been there before. And uh, so I thought I'll bang this out in an afternoon. And I was at UC Santa Barbara. So I thought I'll be surfing after dinner. So here I am 40 years later, and I'm still excavating. And I realized, you know, my life's work has been trying to excavate down to what I would call the bedrock of human endeavor. Like what undergirds everything we know, 
everything we know in terms of what it takes to really succeed and flourish in life. You know, and and I've been so lucky because I've had my firm peak learning for 35 years and we work with all these top companies across all these cultures around the world. And in this work, when you ask people, like, what do you think it is? Like, what does it really take? The, the answers congeal and kind of titrate beautifully. So there's incredible commonality globally, almost like if a 12 year old kid came up to you and said, you know, hey, Doug, tell me the five things it takes to really be a great human being or really flourish in life. And you ask that of people around the world, the answers are incredibly common. My obsession has been, okay, okay, if we know those, what undergirds and fuels are our ability to be the rare human beings, these statistically aberrant human beings who actually go and live and grow those, live and grow those every freaking day when the vast majority of humankind does not, because that's the difference. And so that's what led me to this work. And so, you know, my big discovery, which feeds so well in what you're doing, Doug, which I so admire because it's so needed and it's so innovative, is just that there seemed to be, you know, we took all this research, we had these, I, I was sort of scientifically agnostic because what I did is I went to all these different scientific disciplines and I just call them up. You know, so you'd like to have the head of epidemiology, Johns Hopkins. You say, here's what I'm trying to find out. What do you got? Or Harvard or wherever. And we pieced all this research together. At the time, it was about 3,500, you know, scientific studies. And we said, what's the common element here? And the big aha when we kind of went to the core of it was there's something incredibly high octane and profound about this human interface with what we'll call adversity. And then I kind of went, wow, you know how, when you put on different lenses, you see different things. So like, you know, with you guys, I mean, what you're talking about, you kind of go, wow, what does it take like to even preserve your life force? What does it take to, to, to stay fully alive to your final breath? That changes the way you see things. For me, when you put on that lens, you go, oh my gosh, you know, here's Doug's historian. This is the ink with which we write our entire narrative. This is the core human story. All the great books, all the great religions, all the great societies, all the great stories are about the human interface with adversity. And I'm like, that's it. So like what we do with that, all good or evil spawns from that. So what if we could some way, like you guys know, I mean, you go to your 25 year high school reunion. Is it really the people with the highest IQs who go the furthest in life? No, which, by the way, is a huge relief for me, okay? And, and <laughs> the thing is, IQ predicts next to nothing. We know that. So I thought, what if there were this thing called an AQ? What if there really was a way to measure how people respond to and deal with adversity? And more importantly, what if we could literally permanently rewire and strengthen that? So we've had the chance to do that with now more than 2 million people around the world in 137 countries. We started with version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2. And now with the help of Harvard and MIT and all these other crazy people, we're on version 10.5. And we have discovered that this element, along with this other piece, absolutely fuel and fortify everything we care about in life. So when you look at Doug's work and you go, if we want to regenerate, ourselves and our possibilities and our contribution in the world, we have to fundamentally upshift and upgrade this thing, our, our relationship with adversity. And if we can convert it into fuel, and if we can harness it instead of coping with it, then, then our possibilities are boundless. And so what I so love about what Doug's doing is you take this journey through human history, you know, and you go, Let's look at this through the lens of what happened when the, when the stuff hit the fan. Like, let's look at what happened when we faced real adversity and how this shaped this culture, this society, and how we can change our journey with this as well. And you guys, you know, in the world of finance, I mean, as you know, we have all these great little calculations that are AI-driven AI now about trying to understand, like, 
risk thresholds and risk appetites and all these kinds of things that affect, affect investor mindset and everything else. What I found is that there's a direct correlation between a person's AQ in the world of finance and their investment philosophy and what their gut can take and whether they're going to do the dumb stuff, do exactly the worst things in the moments of truth. Like what does an investor do when adversity strikes? What do advisors do when adversity strikes? And as you guys know, you know, in most cases, most of them do exactly the wrong stuff. And uh, so we can do something about that. So I'm super excited about the conversation um, and super excited to be joining Doug in his noble quest to really equip people to regenerate in these adversity rich times. It's just the coolest thing. Well, if I can cut in, Paul, I mean, that's such a phenomenal and powerful statement of your work and why it's vital coming out of COVID in even more enormous ways than was the case you know, 25, 30 years ago when you were first knocking on Deloitte's door and all of your customers or clients' doors saying, I've got this, I've got this nut that I'm cracking that's going to be powerful. Now, what I'd like our viewers or listeners to think about is, you know, the proposition that binds Paul and me together called Sabbatico, you think of like a high-level coach like Paul, uh, working with grit quotient and adversity theory as his like double holstered setup. Now imagine us walking together on what we call Sabbatico's wonder walks through the streets and the histories and the cultures and the art worlds and the politics of two amazing world cities. Our first Sabbatico cities are going to be Paris and Berlin. And when you talk about like, you know, we can talk to any of our traders, any of your clients, any of your amigos about issues of adversity. And people can talk in this abstract way that distances them, really pushes them away or removes them from the guts of what the problem is around adversity. Or we can do what Paul and I are going to do. We're going to put boots on the ground, walking the cobblestones of the Marais neighborhood in Paris. And we're going to talk about the occupation by the Nazis in the 1940s during World War II. And we're going to go street by street the horrific events of 1942 in the summer when the big roundup of the Jews called the Vélodrome d'Hiver, the Veldiv roundup, took place. But we'll talk about resilience and we'll talk about what it was like in those moments, in that era, in that neighborhood, bouncing back and forth between Paul's expertise and mine. And we get to the point where we're on the Rue de Rosier and we're standing in front of the famous Jewish bakery called Finkelstein and Sons. And this, our clients will look at the founding date. It's 1946. Now, what does it mean that Finkelstein and Sons come and found a cafe in the midst of the Marais neighborhood on Rue de Rosier one year after World War II? It means they survived. It means they came back and walked back or got home from the lager. And so, you know, people could talk in an abstract way about, oh, friends of mine have been through this, or I've had this crisis as I've grown up. And while those are important conversations, our goal as scholars, Paul, as people involved in Sabbatico, and as people who just care about a more holistic view of humanity, our goal is to get people thinking about the horrors and hardships of the past, not to like gross them out about how awful the history has been, but to let them understand that they can have this new toolkit that says, Right now, I'm getting crushed. Right now, everybody around me is getting crushed. But people have been crushed before. So we banish, totally banish that word of this is unprecedented. This is not unprecedented. There have been pandemics. There have been pandemics worse than this one. So we tire of that word. What we want is for people to realize I can carry with me a really agile toolkit that says the world has sucked previously on meta meta levels and people have persevered and how have they persevered my my role is to tell the story paul's role is to say here is how and why people have harnessed adversity to achieve goals that would have actually not been possible had there not been the crises that there were historically 
are you guys kind of following the drift of of what Paul and I are trying to develop here together? We, we are, and I, you know, if I could just cut in there, both of you were an amazing introduction, and, and thank you for that. And you know, I, I was voraciously scribbling notes. Got to go here. Got to go there. Um, just, just for our listeners, I, I think there was something missing in the link when you went onto the uh, the Sabatico story, and and and, and your Sarah was taking people through the streets of these cities. Could you maybe just explain um, what it is you're doing, what the project is, um, and just just give people that sort of link between your introductions and that part of the the conversation? Sure. Let's put it this way, Steve. How many people listening to this podcast have any idea what Van Gogh painted before he left Holland and went to France? Or for that matter, how many people listening to the podcast have any clue or any interest in what Picasso did before he left Barcelona and went north across the Pyrenees? Changing your setting. Jimmy Buffett, you know, a fellow American, has put it well. Changing your latitude can change your attitude. So the sabbatical concept is we're building a mini break, a mini sabbatical that takes people out of their normal environment and puts them into this hothouse plant of a cohort of top talent leaders and rising executives from around the world who may hail corporately from Google or from Deloitte or Prudential or wherever. But they come together with this shared mission of regeneration and following the Sabatico three pathway learning model where mind fitness and mindfulness is kind of mission critical. We can't do anything with people until they chill the hell out and recognize I'm in France, baby. This should feel good. And if it doesn't feel good here, guess what? Note to self, it's not going to feel good anywhere. So the mind fitness piece is key. And we've got yoga and guided meditations and all kinds of thoughts about public space and green space to chill people the hell out. Then our second pathway in sabbatico, friends, is all about perspective. And that's where Paul and I are going to have like a marriage made in heaven as academics and kind of disruptors, where we take together our ideas and walk the streets of our cities in these intensive two-hour to two-and-a-half-hour bursts we call wonder walks. And then the third piece after mind fitness and after perspective is about growth mindset. And Paul and I will have things to say there too. But we, what we want to do is have our people return, whether they do one week of sabbatical or two. We want them to blast home with a sustainable toolkit that says, I don't have to work these insane hours and trade away the things that I loved about myself before I began this journey. I get to work hard. I get to be successful but I don't have to lose touch with me. So hopefully that's a little bit, it's a three pathway learning project, Steve, and our idea is to work in two cities each year. And our first cities for 2022 are uh, Paris and Berlin, because we think they're so dynamic and so growth mindset oriented. Okay, that's that's fantastic. And that, that's the lovely link that was missing. And thank you so much. And it, it feels like you're helping people find themselves and, you know, and and I love that because, you know, one of my own teachers as a coach had this um, wonderful um, model, which she, she used, which she created herself, which is that, you know, in her opinion, we are all born with a diamond at our core. And, and that's how we come into the world, a beautiful, shining, crystal cut diamond. But then life over time, just covers it up and covers it up and covers it up with our experiences, our traumas, the way we cope, to the point that it just gets completely lost. But it's still there. And and I love her. She used to say, your job as a coach is to help people rediscover that diamond, rediscover who they were, rediscover their core being, their core goodness, which has been lost, almost like it's been covered in, in as she discovered it, layers and layers of a nail varnish or, or, or paint. Uh, and, and that sounds in a way that almost what you guys are trying to do. I think that's a great, I appreciate that so much, Steve. I was teaching romanticism in art uh, recently and thinking about Samuel Taylor Coleridge and, and Williams, w- William Wordsworth and their arguments about, 
you know, the notion of the child as father of the man. They had this beautiful argument that English romanticists from the art world to the literary so embrace that I think it's an amazing thing for us to consider as business professionals. And that is, we do begin as this diamond. W words were said that like our closest proximity to like beauty and perfection and the kind of etherish pull of forever is when we're first born. And then this is good news for all of us as we age in place, friends, as we get closer to the grave, that magic returns. It's in between, the English romantics tell us, that there's a long and sustained period of forgetting. And that's even before the English grammar school has worked its magic, because these parents are writing early in the 19th century. But if you think about it, for all of us, it is true. And for your listeners who are traders and highly successful individuals in a whole you know, panoply of, of different careers, think about the kind of sharper edge that gets dull by that process of being like really fantastically great at certain elements of trading. At the same time, if you go back time and time again to the same gut hunch that won you big something two years prior, that's no guarantee at all that you aren't missing total opportunities to tactically retreat and then attack in new ways with new power and new initiative. So for us with Sabatigo, we're not interested in being boring. And we're not interested in doing any kind of stupid tour through gorgeous cities. People can do that anytime they want. We're interested in taking people into the heart of what they're most afraid of. Because what they're most afraid of, our research in Sabatigo shows, what they're most afraid of is failure. And being afraid of that is everything. It limits your openness to decision making. It makes you less agile. It takes away the nimble kind of creativity that a child can have and turns instead into this rigorous thing where do you trust your intuition? Do you trust your gut that says this is a really bad deal, but I'm going to go for it anyway? Do you trust your gut? We want people on sabbatical. They listen to Paul and they listen to me and we talk and we engage. And we're in these amazing settings. We think people are going to have a sharpness and an edge that's going to make them better people. And I think as a corollary, make them a lot better at what they're doing professionally. So just amazing to see your perspective on this. And I think diversification of perspective, which is kind of what Sabatico is, is driving, the the power of, of, of really being curious around cultures uh, and taking oneself out of one's normal zone. And, of course, a lot of traders, that, quite a lot of people that listen to this podcast, you know, their day may be, a, you know, a 7 a.m. to a 8 p.m. in front of a computer. And they then worry about everything they didn't do during that day and what's ahead tomorrow into the evening. They then go to bed stressed and wake up in a bad state and then have to do the same again. And 85 years later, they start reflecting back on their life and start, you know, someone asks them, well, what do you achieve? Where do you go? What did you learn? <clears throat> and they may not have a very particular good conversation to have at that point. And I think it is really important for us to be much broader thinkers as to just our position on the planet. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, I think what Doug's serving up so brilliantly is sort of accelerated yeah. wisdom, and you know, wisdoms like money. You know, a lot of times people accumulate it at a point where it can't be put to as much use as it could have had they been younger. And uh, you know, if you can accelerate that wisdom, then you're radically enhancing people's potential for contribution and impact. And the kind of people that you're going to lure, lure into Sabatago um, are exactly the kind of people who are high impact individuals. You know, I think about this one guy I'm coaching right now. He's a CEO of a company, tech company that Goldman Sachs uh, decided they loved and kind of got involved with. And they're now, you know, he went from like 82 million to 400 million and now they want to take them to 1.2 billion in the next couple of years. Can you imagine the stress that that puts on him and his team and the people and everything else, right? And and you know, I was just with him a few days ago, and I was telling him, you got to understand, they will suck the marrow out of your bones. They don't they don't care about your vitality and and well being. They don't care 
about you flourishing. They just want you to endure and deliver the numbers and get them to their next equity event and move on. So you are in charge of who you are and what you grow and and what you become during that time. And if you don't take charge of that, no one will. And you will get sucked dry. And the world is filled. He's a high level guy, granted. And there are others who are much higher level that we deal with. But the world is filled with people today who are feeling depleted and are feeling lost and are feeling aimless. You know, the great resignation is just a sign, right? It's just people kind of saying, when I step back and look at my life, I'm not sure this is all making that much sense. And I think what Doug gets to do is, you know, this beautiful thing of uniquely providing this accelerated wisdom. You know, the thing is, happiness and well-being are gauged. They're comparative measures every day. So if I ask you, are you happy? You immediately, you're in your head, are doing this comparison, like compared to what? Compared to who I've been, compared to others. If I asked you, are you wealthy? You would compare that instantly on some sort of scale you have in your mind, right? So what Doug's doing is he's giving people this context, this almost reset button to kind of rethink what any of that even means. And like he said, I never thought about this, Doug, but you're the guy, the one guy I know is probably roaming the planet with like your blood boiling every time you hear the word unprecedented. (laughs) And I'm thinking that's so true. It's because the reason we use it is we lack context, right? So to us, it's the worst ever and this and that. And you're kind of going, really? Let me give you some stories and some evidence that tell you otherwise. So anyway, that's why I'm a really big fan of it is I love the accelerated wisdom. I love that you're giving people the opportunity to extricate themselves for this precious period from the marrow sucking insanity that they're involved in and really rejuvenate and regenerate in the ways they need to, to be the kind of leaders and people they can be. I think it's important um, to note, like that's fantastic, Paul. And, you know, we've done a bunch of research at Sabbatico with uh, surveys and, and kind of deep dive engagements with, a high net worth individuals and executives who are struggling. The, the key to understand about these struggles is the struggles are private. So on one of our questionnaires, we, we literally ask, how many times have you cried by yourself in the last month? You know, more than five, more than 10, more than 15, and then give us context on that. A lot of these super powerful people we're pitching sabbatico toward and who are clients of yours have had either A, multiple examples of closing the door of their bathroom and just being alone with a flood of tears they hide from everyone in their circle, from their partners, from their children, from their families, because they can't be seen to be at remove from the heroic power of breadwinning and success that's really been their kind of you know stock and trade. So that's important to realize. Suffering alone with those tears that it's fine to have moments of even deep melancholia. That's that's the human experience, and I'm down with it. But where I think it's hard is when you're in your private space and you're feeling crushed and collapsed and you're losing your ability to manage emotions, you've lost perspective. There's no way to be agile in that moment. There's no way to find the creativity and the power you need to really harness your adversity and move on. Some of that has to be stabilized. And my work from the 1870s through the First World War shows doctors intervened at these moments and said, hey, I don't care how important your carpet making business is. You're heading to a spa town for three weeks. And here's exactly what you're going to do. And this deeply like powerful regimen of holistic help was put in place at these watering places to try and bring people back from the brink of unrecognizable, unmanageable emotional experiences. It kind of you know works. what, Doug, as we talk Honestly. about this, I realize we're missing something here, which is, you know, we're making this sound like this self-indulgent, you know, like repair journey that you go on, you know, almost out of need and desperation. 
I view it as the ex- opposite, which is, you know, if you're, think about it, if you own a company or if you're running a company and you've got the, and, and the talent pool is more competitive and fickle than it's ever been. I mean, with, but no question and all that kind of stuff, what could you do to invest in your people so that they're, they're delivering their best stuff every day and they want to stay forever or, you know, for the foreseeable future. And so you think of it the other way, you flip it and you go, what's like the best money spent for a business leader or a business owner for their key talent? And this is what I'm talking about there. And by the way, they're, I, I mean, you guys are coaches, you know, they're all like desperately asking, what can we do to, to move the needle on, on retention and engagement right now? Because it, it's gone haywire, Right. So that's the way I think of it too, Doug. You know, I'm realizing we're sitting here talking about the person, which is so humanistic, you know, but really if we were even being capitalistic about this, you know, from a company's point of view, it's just a freaking smart investment. Well, I I couldn't agree with you more, obviously. That's, and the reason I, look, the great resignation is something that we were a part of calling in the sabbatical family right the first weeks of COVID. It, it, we were talking about this way before it had even moved any needles anywhere. And I think what you're saying is so right on, Paul. What people want now who are top talent leaders, and they're facing this kind of existential crisis, like, what am I here for? What am I meant to do? Why is what I'm doing not feeding my spirit anymore? There are lots of reasons why people reach that point of desperation, but the number one thing employers can do to help their people understand that they care is to give them something like time and a structure and the kind of passion, Paul, that you and all the disruptors and I are going to bring to this endeavor. This tells top talent, we care about you. We care about you having a sustainable life. We care about you being able to go away and come back better. Just coming in very quickly to remind our listeners that uh, the Alphamind podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. If you're serious about trading and you're serious about developing yourself as a trader, do look into their home study course. It is based on the diploma program which they run at the world-renowned London School of Economics. Uh, You can find out more about it on the Alphamind blog. Just Google Alphamind blog or go to alphamindblog.blogspot.com. And there you can find out how listeners to the Alphamind podcast can get a disc count on the full cost of this online course thank you and uh, back to the podcast we're, we're all all four of us are in this same space we go in we have these conversations we we talk about this with organizations and then you know they're, they're, i love this you know so often i get yeah i really get this let me just see if i get this through the budget <laughs> <laughs> and then i don't know, come back and say, do you have a five minute hack you can give us and i'm like <laughs> you know it's you just don't get it it's, you know, so I'm, I'm like, you know, how, how do we break into this? I mean, it does happen, but at the margins and only at the margins still. H- how does this get out there? I know from people that I work with, I mean, you know, the, the trading space, it's a performance activity, the same as being a leader, the same as being a manager, or being an entrepreneur, being a sports person. You know, in the sports world, people get downtime. That's what they do. They only have to perform at certain moments. And of course, it's all about that. How can we get them performing at their very best? Leaders, managers, you know, people daily in business. You know, I I know how much damage it does for people in this world just sitting in front of the screens the whole time as if they're going to miss the greatest trade ever. And of course, when it come, when it happens, most of them aren't on it anyway. <laughs> but, you know, they only look back at it after, I'm so obvious, you know. What... Where does this start to actually become a revolution rather than just something people are talking at the margins? My take on that is that it always starts with the early adopters who become authentic zealots, right? And often zealots, not through just words of passion, but through the notable upshift in their how they conduct themselves and how they roam the earth, you know, and you can feel it. I mean, you know, I always kind of think of it this way, guys, you know, I, I always ask people, 
you know, if you want to gauge the importance of anything, remove it. So like, let's take grit, right? You ask leaders, you know, on a scale one to 10 for the kind of people you want to hire, the kind of people you want to be, the kind of business you want to build on a scale one to 10, how important is grit? They'll go, it's a 10. So now take a super capable leader who has zero grit. What do you got? Nothing. Same thing with energy or life force, right? So on a scale of one ten, it's a ten. Remove energy. What do you got? It doesn't matter how bright you are, how accomplished are you, everything else. You just can't bring it the way you want. And so you know what what Doug's doing with his whole thing is that he's sort of saying, you know, as nice as some of these apps are and everything else, and our Apple watches and all this stuff, you just can't tweet regeneration. You know. And you, you, you got to have people have an immersive, you got to slow down to speed up. And sometimes you got to hit the reset button. And, and that's what, you know, this is really meant to do. I love your analysis or your story about traders because, you know, in our world of grit and the research we do around that, we talk about the difference between dumb grit and smart grit, Right. And there are a lot of people who have this sort of never, never, never quit. I'll work, you know, a hundred hours a day. I don't care whatever it takes to get the deal. And as we know, that's not always the most effective thing. So, you know, part of the accelerated wisdom with that Doug's experience creates is sort of helping us as human beings differentiate profoundly between the difference of bad grit and good grit, which really makes us dramatically more effective. So, I think that's just a big part of it. And it applies to everybody. It applies to everything we do in life. I had a quote ready, which when you were talking before, I, I thought, you know, about AQ. I mean, I, you know, I'd love to hear more about that as well at some point here. Um, but I, I, I dragged up a quote from Warren Buffett, which is a very well-known quote by him, which obviously links into this investing trading world. But he says, investing is not a game where the guy with the 160 IQ beats the guy with the 130 IQ. Once you have ordinary intelligence, what you need is the temperament to control the urges that get other people into trouble in investing. Ooh, love it. Love it, love it, love it. You know, from my lens, you know, it's like, who are you in those moments of truth? How well do you keep your stuff together in the moments of truth, right? And we know there's a direct correlation between your AQ and what we call self-regulation, right? Which is your ability to keep your cool and use your reasoning powers effectively when others are losing their stuff, right? That's what he's talking about. And he's spot on. Love it. What a great quote. Send that. <laughs> I want that. I think to think about these these issues that we're talking about here, you know, from the historian or cultural historian's point of view, what I love to do, uh, particularly if I'm working with, you know, top talent trader types, you know, some of the listeners of our of our podcast today, I like to talk about military examples because I think they resonate so powerfully. And for us, when we're in Paris or we're in Berlin and we talk about like the resistance to the Nazis in the 1940s, like 1942, 1943, there's not a lot you're going to find because anybody who raises their head at all is, is of course, tortured by the Gestapo and, 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 and murdered. And yet to look as we will do on sabbatico at the few examples of these people who stood up, and I don't mean even just the notable people like Klaus von Stauffenberg and the assassination attempt on Hitler in, in uh, the summer of 1944. I mean like younger people, college student age who these people were and the courage it took for them to stand up and oppose the Nazis, knowing how tough the world was around them and what they'd likely face. I mean, that's a conviction that's incredibly powerful to study as an historical example, just as it's important to study the people who didn't put their heads up in those kinds of ways that almost ultimately always resulted in getting killed. But the other folks who are working just as powerfully, but secretly, in a resistance practice against Hitler, for example. I think we can do so much with history to let people understand the human stuff, the stuff that's our God-given right, our inheritance from all of the people who came before us, that stuff is in us. 
whether it's Steve's diamond or it's the good grit Paul's talking about, or it's what Mark has found through a whole lifetime of being a pra practitioner of mindfulness, that stuff is in there. It's our inheritance. And what we need to do is equip all of us, and especially our clients on Sabbatico and the people we coach, with the tools they need to open up that inheritance and put that baby to use. Because once they do, everything from how they trade to how they come home at the end of the day, to how they vacation with their families, to how they love, everything will be better. So I'm just curious for you guys, Mark and Steve, you know, with the, with the, with the peeps you deal with every day, you know, where it, 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 so much of it's about productivity and performance, right? And, and generally, you know, one of the underlying assumptions in your, your world is more is more and all that. What do you think is the kind of the best argument for something like Sabatago to the crazy people you deal with, the type A overperforming productivity driven human beings who create bang out the numbers? Well, I think perhaps if I can go share something first on some of the people that I've coached and in, in, in the, the journey so far. The big reveal to me is for them to understand that it's not just about the money and they suddenly start to realize there's this whole other dynamic about their purpose that's suddenly something that they, they want to get involved with, they want to understand. And if that can sit alongside them having perhaps more balance towards the way they interact with you know the market and when they do that and when and when they decide to put more effort into the purpose and the family and the, the real things of life, the cultural curiosity, as, as we've talked about here, and, and that sort of willingness to go out there and explore and connect with others because we've been siloed for two years and we need to do that. And perhaps when people start to understand that, they come back to their role of you know managing risk and identifying opportunity with a much more balanced way of looking at things and that's a perhaps a more balanced way of looking at risk as well and perhaps not throwing it all away on the big massive trade but being being more sensible i suppose about things i've certainly found that but also people start to recognize that it's about the collective yeah you know, it's not just about them it's about the collective you know sort of gathering around them as their ecosystem the power of that team and of course if everyone approached this and you know, if we looked at the species, as it were, acquiring AQ, you know, the collective benefit to the species of, you know, that accumulative AQ is phenomenal. But yeah, I think certainly from my perspective, yeah, the conversations change. I think COVID has threw it, thrown in that dynamic to almost make the conversation change. And that's actually, in, in, in my view, that, that that's a good thing. But people are kind of now starting to realize, actually, well, what's really important here? What, what am I missing? H how do I show up when something goes wrong? Because I may not be showing up in a very um, effective way. And my response to, you know, to failure, um, maybe I need to start modifying that because perhaps I've not responded particularly well. I'm sure Steve has got tons to add to that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was, I, I was, you know, as soon as you started talking before both of you, I, I had things come into my head and you know one, one of the stories I tell often is uh, another coaching colleague of mine who, who was my own mentor my own coach many years ago um, said to me and he, he works in the same field with lots of traders again top traders in hedge funds and he said Steve have you ever noticed how many of these people who are really successful have suffered some sort of early life trauma and I said, yes, I have. And he said, it's, it's almost bizarre how and they seem to be able to detach themselves from the things every day in life that are bothering people. And, you know, I have, I've seen lots of people who, you know, some people had serious traumas, like, you know, dreadful things happened to them or they, they, they were refugees or, you know, an abusive parent. Um, other people had um just just the trauma of growing up but they were maybe i've worked with a lot of people who were dyspraxic or dyslexic going through school so school was a series of traumas every single day you know or autistic you know um and they were told they were lazy or this that and the other 
And yet they've come on to achieve incredible success in the world of trading and financial markets. And we had one individual who really stands out for me. He was on the podcast last last year. His name was Dave Tate. So he was on two two episodes. And he was sexually abused as a child uh, by his father and his father's friends. Um, and I can say this because he had a film made about his story. And he went on to be an incredibly successful trader at Goldman Sachs, um, was one of the founders of Bluecrest Capital, which one of the world's largest hedge funds, um, and then achieved great success at the, the two Swiss investment banks, UBS and, and Credit Suisse. And he's now CEO of the World Gold Council, so I'm sure he won't have too much um, issue with me mentioning this. He, he also has climbed Mount Everest five times, um, one of only, I think, perhaps a dozen people to have done that. And would have also scaled K2 had he not been able to, uh, not been sent back by the weather. But, uh, and he did all that to raise money for children's charities. An incredible story. And I mean, it is the perfect example of grit. And, and he talked about how he had to develop that grit as a young kid to survive those terrible traumas, you know, to, to be able to distance himself. And, and that actually comes out in the film, which is called, I think it was called Sapphire and White. Um, about how he survived those experiences. He almost had to learn to detach from life. And, and, and I, you know, this human ability to live and survive is just incredible. And I think we talk about, I think that's almost what you're, you're getting at, Doug, when you're talking about taking people to these places where dreadful things happened and they came through it. Things that we can't even begin to imagine. So our everyday thing that we haven't had to report turn up on time or, or you know, from... Or, or, or my compliance officer hasn't had his call returned, but they're really not that important. <laughs> well, they are, but we can live through them because in the big picture, we can cope with a lot more than that. But we almost kind of lose that. I think the thing that, that you lose too, uh, that's really important for our audience to consider, like all of us get a, a powerful kind of release of, every hormone under the sun when we win. It, it's this feeling of like, yes, I signed a deal. Yes, I've completed this trade. And over time, that, that buildup of all the wins is such a kind of powerful energy that we all feed on. That's the thing that keeps us going at work. That's the thing that keeps most of the traders you guys work with fired up every day. And yet you can lose that little port part of life force. You can lose not the capacity to win, but you can lose the capacity to feel good about it or excited about it once it happens enough. And that's where I think we all come in as coaches and we all come in as more holistic, humanistic folks. We want to take people who are used to winning and make sure that that's, that becomes sustainable, not just in your late 20s and 30s, but sustainable as you go on in life to change the world by founding charities like the colleague you're talking about, becoming a leader of things beyond the monetized world where we've all succeeded. And I think that's like, that's noble work, friends. That, that, that really is noble work. So Doug, it's important to understand, where can everybody find out more about, about you and, and the journey of Sabatigo? The quickest way to get started on learning about Sabatigo is to simply go online to our website. It's, 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 it's Sabatigo, S A B. A-T-I-G-O dot com, sabbatigo. And I think there, you know, we talk about what our vision is, what our product is, what our solution is. Uh, and we talk a little bit about the April, May uh, journey that we're building right now for about 25 lucky leaders from around the globe who want to be a part of this uh, avant-garde kind of retooling of business acumen and energy. And the thing about like Paul Stoltz is a centerpiece of our product. He's a centerpiece of our solution. But on sabbatico.com, you'll be able to see the other incredible disruptors who bring just literally decades of amazing experience. Paul is our disruptor for grit and resilience. But Jeff Schwartz was principal at Deloitte for 20 years and headed up their future of work program for Deloitte International. Jeff's one of our disruptors looking at future of work issues. Natalie Nixon, Dr. Nixon is 
created a master's program that's been phenomenally successful for her university. Now she runs her own coaching and consultancy. And her big piece is very much about creativity. So we've got these top talent, amazing global known leaders who are coaches, each with super fantastic specialties. And then my goal is to be the one who kind of stitches it all together, art, culture, history, politics, literature, and brings it all together. If that offers a, you know, a little bit more insight, gentlemen. That's great. And, and just, just one thing, I just, I, I suppose when it, it, it was implicit in there, but I just wonder if you could really make it explicit. What is the purpose of, of Sabatago? Sabatago really is a regeneration journey for top talent leaders. And as Mark said, you know, these don't have to be executives per se who come with us. They can be startup gurus. They can be people who are even mid-level managers but are tracking toward great success. The mission of Sabatago is to make people better. That's really the simplest way to put it, friends. It's time to perhaps start to wrap up I'd, I'd, from my point of view i'd like to wrap up with one phrase that um there's a quote from some chap called dr grit who i think is present with us without adversity we can never unleash our greatness dr paul stoltz i think that's a very good place to leave this and i think both steve and i are very grateful to yourself and doug for for sharing with us the sabbatical journey, the sabbatical opportunity, um, and also as a human species, our frailty and, and how we need we need this stuff called grit and adversity con- quotient um, to really manage the ups and downs of life that are there ahead for us all. Beautiful. Such an honor and pleasure to be with you guys. And Doug, I just tip my hat to you for what you're putting together. It's just visionary and so impactful and gentlemen so lovely to meet you and join with your audience and uh hopefully this has been of some value to them it certainly has flown by for me thank yeah. you yeah, there'll be a part two i'm I echo sure those thanks paul and honestly the work that you've done for decades has 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 done a tremendous amount to change the way people walk through the space of their lives it's an honor to be here i thank everybody for the chance to to talk about what our goals are, what our projects and what our human issues are as, as people who coach uh, and, and certainly to talk about sabbatical. So thank you so much, uh, Paul, of course, but also Mark and Steve very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for listening today. And we hope you enjoyed and got something out of this podcast episode today. And if you did, we would really appreciate it if you could go on to um, the ratings or review page, of whichever podcast service you use and leave hopefully a favourable rating and uh, a pleasant review about the Alpha Mind podcast. We do enjoy bringing these to you. We get a lot of pleasure from it. Um, We hope you get something out of it. Um, If you want to know more about us and our service, do look us up on alpha-mind.net. You can also go onto our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. You'll find articles, past articles, links to past podcast episodes. Um, You'll also see connections to pages where you can get a discount on the STA home study course. And again, thank you to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can also find a discount code for the uh, Traders Mind Journal on there, which is uh, a product we spoke about on our uh, podcast a few weeks ago. Please also do feel free to connect to us. If you're interested in our services, in our coaching services, in our coaching programs, you can look up more details about those also on the blog page um, or contact us info at alpha-mind.net and we can tell you more about them. Or do contact myself or Mark directly on Twitter my handle is at alphamind101. Mark's handle is at alphamind102. Or you can connect with us and contact us through LinkedIn. Again, if you're interested to know more about our work. As a reminder, we work with individual traders, um, both on the sell side and the buy side. We work with retail traders, um, investment bank traders, energy firm traders, traders in hedge funds and asset management firms. We also work with people connected to the trading world. We are executive coaches. So we work with leaders and managers and teams within businesses, helping to make the businesses more effective and more productive. One last thing, we do have a newsletter um, and there's good information about us. Always a useful article on there, links to previous episodes. 
So you, you can subscribe for that also on the Alphamine blog page. Finally, that just leaves us to say thank you once again, and we wish you the very best of luck in the markets. Thank you.